Hallo und herzlich willkommen bei Arbor. Heute haben wir Dr. Laura Markham zu Gast und führen ein Interview zu ihrem neuen Buch Gelassene Eltern, zufriedene Kinder aus dem Arbor Verlag. Und ich sage herzlich willkommen, Laura. Hallo, Laura. Nice to have you here. Thank you. I'm so glad to join you. Yeah, great. Um, first of all, I would like to know, um, how many kids do you have yourself? And how old are they? I have two children. Beautiful. I have a daughter who's 24 mm -hmm. and, uh, and a son who's 28. He's in law school. Oh, yes. wonderful. Great. So it's been a long time since you had all those challenges that our people sure. have reading your books. Yes, so, but you know, the good thing is I yeah. can see how it works. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 28 years ago, 28 years ago, I was holding my first baby. Yes. And I didn't find the resources I needed to advise me. Yeah. And so I sort of, I read everything I could get my hands on, all the research studies, And I made it up as I went along yes. and I found sources of wisdom as I went along and I never punished them. I never, uh, they never had a timeout, which most people in the United States do timeouts. They, they yes. certainly never had a spanking. They never were yelled at. They oh. were, they just, they had an upbringing as I describe. Okay, so and they out. came out great. Yes. <laughs> okay, so can they cope with stress? Can they cope with frustration? Are there Oh, much more. Yeah. Much more than most kids. They're more resilient than most kids. And the reason is that they built up resilience as they went along because they knew it was okay to fail. They knew that they had support. They Right. And they had backup, but they were allowed to do it them, you know, do it myself. My daughter was very strong willed, do it myself from the time <laughs> she was very little. And she did. And she is now very resilient. And she's also, you know, I joke about her when she was little. Yeah. People used to say things to me like, Ooh, she's a spicy one. <laughs> <laughs> And I pity you when she's a teenager. Yes. And right. Because when she was three and four years old, she was a handful. She was very challenging, very big feelings. Right. But by the time she was a teenager, she had become so emotionally intelligent that she was pretty calm in the teen years. And in fact, she was the, the rock at the center of her friend group. So all of her friends relied on her as the person who there was no drama, There were no, you know, who could manage herself no yeah. matter what was going on. And I think when kids be develop emotional intelligence, yeah. they can manage themselves no matter what. Wonderful. So one question that parents always have is, won't the kids become too dependent if I always help, I'm always there, I'm always trying to co-regulate? How are your kids? How interdependent or independent are they now they're grown up? So I will tell you about my kids, but I want to add, this is not just a study of two kids. <laughs> this is, there are research studies that verify everything I'm telling you with many thousands of kids, right? And I have seen many, many thousands of children grow up with these practices. And they're all individuals. They're all different. They have all different wants and needs and desires and strengths and weaknesses, but they're all They're, inter, they're emotionally skilled in managing themselves mm -hmm. and they're emotionally skilled in relating to other people. So I, and I think those, that is what emotional intelligence is. So when you say, wouldn't they become dependent? Yes. So, so first of all, we know that in terms of emotions, young children, their brain, which manages emotions, right? The brain and the nervous system is born pretty immature. It's, pre, it's unfinished. Mm -hmm. And it takes shape throughout babyhood and childhood. It takes shape in response to the environment. And what's the environment for a little baby? Mommy, daddy? Yes, it is mommy, daddy. And maybe big sister, big brother, maybe a nanny or a babysitter, maybe grandma or grandpa. But basically, it's the people who love that child, that baby, who are there for that baby. And when the baby learns that he or she can count on, Mm -hmm. those adults, yes. 
they, they develop trust. They settle into love and open their heart and they become able to relate to other human beings and trust them. And that means that when they get upset about something, because there will be upsets, their children, it's a big world, there will be many disappointments and they can't regulate very well yet because their prefrontal cortex is still developing. So when that happens, if there is a grown up they trust there who can say to them, oh, sweetheart, I'm right here. I'm right here. Then they're, they, they may still cry. Their, their, their ice cream just dropped on the ground. They, they still may cr- sob their heart out. Their, their grown up can't make it better. They're not going to let them eat the ice cream off the ground, right? And we, so we don't make them stop crying, but we help them. <laughs> We, we, we comfort them. We say, I'm right here. We don't say, it's okay. Don't worry. We'll buy you another one. Now, maybe you do buy them another one sometimes. You know, that's okay if that's easy to do. But most of the time, that you're not removing the problem. You're simply allowing the child to have the emotions. Mm-hmm. And this, when you use the word co-regulation, I think we just should explain what co-regulation is. Mm-hmm. What it means is that We all know as adults that sometimes it's hard to regulate our emotions, but we do a better job of it than our children because we have more brain development. And what we'd love is if our children, when they are our age, can do an even better job than we do. And they probably will be able to. And the reason is that we're co-regulating with them now. When they're little, if we co-regulate with them, and co-regulate means we're, we're dismayed by the ice cream falling down too. And also by the fact that our child is hurling themselves to the ground and sobbing and crying and angry. It's all your fault, mommy. Right. And we're distressed by that. Yes. We, we take a deep breath. We remind ourselves that of course our child is acting like a child because they are a child and that it's not the end of the world and we can manage it. We can cope, we can handle it. And then we reassure our child that we're right there and it's okay, we, they can cry as much as they want, and we're right there, and we understand. And children don't need to have everything they want. What they need is an adult who understands and who gives them a safe place to feel their feelings. Mm-hmm. Now, you may still think, well, then they'll, they'll be children who always have big emotions and drama, but it turns out to be just the opposite. When we allow them to have feelings, they develop a relationship with their own emotions that's very healthy. Mm -hmm. What they do is they develop a way of just doing just what we're doing with them, accepting their emotions and being compassionate toward themselves. It's okay. They might feel to themselves, and this is a great thing to teach them to do this with themselves, right? Which is a a compassionate holding. And, And they can learn to do that for themselves. So we, by providing that, calm witness, that holding environment, that compassionate loving, they learn to do that for themselves. And is it all that we have to do? We're just the calm witness and we say, I see your pain and it's really- Not only, not Not only. only. What else do we have to do to get them on the right path? How can we cope with that? Yes. So the first thing is that, and often that's all we have to do. Often we just hold and they- they, they accept. I mean, that's where resilience happens. Like, I wanted that ice cream, mm. but we're already four blocks away from the ice cream place. We're on our way to grandma's. We have to get to grandma's on a certain time. We can't go back. Yes. I'm very disappointed about that. I really wanted that ice cream that dropped. But daddy's holding my hand. He says it's going to be okay, and we'll get an ice cream next week when we come back. And I'm going to be brave, and I'm going to be okay. And I can't wait to see grandma, right? So they, they start to, they accept it. Basically, you know, we spend so much energy fighting yes. what happens. Mm-hmm. And when we fight what happens, we can't accept it, right? We can't, and it's just a defense against the feelings. Mm-hmm. If the child is still fighting with you, they're saying, no, I want to go back and get the ice cream, right? And that means they're saying to you, I can't accept that the ice cream dropped. I'm not going to be comforted. Yeah. And what happens as they're allowed to have those feelings, yes. they're, they're, then they're willing to accept the feelings like, I'm just going to sob my heart out here. I'm just going to feel the disappointment because 
it's safer because you provided them that. Once they get to that point, then they move even beyond that where they don't necessarily need to sob so hard. They begin to develop, you know, you would expect a 10-year-old would not be sobbing this way, right? Maybe a four-year-old would be, but not the 10-year-old. Why? Because the 10-year-old has learned that, all right, I'm really disappointed, but it's okay. I can live with this and I'll get another ice cream next week. I'm not right? going to die. <laughs> right. I'm not going to die. But the four-year-old doesn't know that. But mm -hmm. as we provide this holding environment and the four-year-old lets the feelings swamp them and then they make it through the other side, they develop resilience. And they will, they will be able, like the eight-year-old, much earlier, maybe at age six, maybe at age five, to handle the disappointment. It, so when you say, is that the only thing we do? Yeah. We're, we're the loving, compassionate witness. That's the most important thing okay. in emotion coaching. However, there are, that's called emotion coaching, what I'm describing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but then the next thing we do, well, the next thing we do after they've settled down, we might well say to them, you really wanted that ice cream. I, you know, we, we, I wonder what we can do to ha get an ice cream next week. Or mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a way that we could keep it from falling off your ice cream cone. Maybe you could have it in a dish next week. Your so, problem I offer empathy and I offer a solution. Well, you offer a solution and you all, yes, you're right. You offer a solution for okay. a four-year-old. By the time they're a little older and even with a four-year-old, you might well be asking them what they could do. Mm. Oh my goodness. It's so hard when your ice cream falls. I wonder if maybe you could ask for it in a dish next time. You know, yeah. no, I love the cone. I understand that you love the cone. I wonder what the solution could be because you don't want to give up the cone. Yeah. And then the four-year-old says, I could have the dish of ice cream and also have the cone on the side with nothing in it. <laughs> and I could eat both. And that's like, so, because four-year-olds are good at solving problems when they're not upset. Yeah. So by now the child is not upset because you've listened. Okay. So, and this is the point where my parents that I talk to say, okay, this is a nice theory, but this is a challenge for me as a, an adult too, to stay calm, not get upset, mm -hmm. wait until the child finds a solution. So you have a counseling practice for ca a counseling office for parents. What are their challenges with this kind of education with this kind of um, emotional coaching they, they come to you with and say, I need help. Well, the biggest challenge is that parents can't have a hard time regulating themselves because no one took care of their emotions when they were little, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't develop resilience. They didn't develop emotional intelligence. And in fact, emotions make them very uncomfortable. Okay. So I don't know whether this is worldwide, but John Gottman, who's a researcher in um, the United States, one of the foremost family researchers, he wrote the book, The Emotionally Intelligent Child. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a new book, it's an old book. He wrote it based on his, um, he did a tremendous amount of research with couples and he would watch them as they would, you know, they would bring, the, as they got married and their relationship progressed, they would have a child and he watched them with their children and he analyzed the interactions. And he found that, 60 or 70 percent of American parents, and this was maybe, um, I'm saying 30 years ago, so it's gotten a little better, but we don't know how much better because we haven't follow, followed it. We just see a study here and a study there. And we have a, this question a lot in Germany that parents say, this is a nice theory, but how can I cope with my emotions so I can cope with the emotions of the child? Yes, exactly. And what he found is that most parents are so uncomfortable with their child's emotions, that they either punish the child, don't you raise your voice, you go to your room until you can behave yourself, until you can be civil, right? Or they shame the child. Yes. Well, that's just a little scratch. Big boys don't cry about something like that. Or they um, just try to distract the child. Oh, don't worry, we'll buy you another one, right? So there are many ways that parents can um, deny their child's emotions. Oh, you're not really upset about that, right? Um, but the healthy parents are the ones who were able to say to their child just what we've been saying, like, that, that's really disappointing for you. And you ask, how do they do that? Yes, how the can first, we learn to do that if we didn't learn it when we were right. young? Exactly. The first thing to do is always to pause and to notice what's going on. That's the first thing. I call it stop, drop, and breathe. You stop what you're doing. Yes. You drop your agenda. 
Maybe your agenda is just to get the kid to grandma's or just to get your shopping done. Yeah. You drop your agenda. That's beautiful. You take the deep breath. You probably take a few deep breaths. <laughs> because you remember when your child's upset, you get upset automatically, mm -hmm. right? And when you're upset, you're tr we call it being triggered. You're triggered, which means you're not fully present and thinking. You, the blood flow is actually diverted from your brain to, yes, to fight, flight, and freeze. Fight, yeah. flight, or freeze. It's an emergency. Yes. Panic. Exactly. And so you're not thinking straight at that moment. So uh -huh. stop, drop, and breathe gives you a deep breath and it signals your body. Your body says, oh, she's taking a deep breath. I guess it's not an emergency after all. It may not be an emergency. Stop the adrenaline, boys. We don't need more adrenaline. No emergency after all. Right? Okay, great. And you so calm can down. Can people learn this from a book? Oh, yes. Can they? From my book? Oh, absolutely. The whole first section of the book is about learning to regulate yourself. That's beautiful. That's great. So I can learn with, with, with the book. What, did I, what do I have to do? Do I have to meditate or fill in surveys? What's the, what do I have to do then to do, learn this? All right. So the most important thing is to practice. So I hope everybody who's watching this, I, I'm sorry, uh, no, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing to you if your child gets upset today and tomorrow and the next day. It's a blessing <laughs> because you get to practice then. And here's what you practice. Yes. When your child gets upset, the first thing you do, before you even tend to your child, you stop, drop your agenda, and take a deep breath. You take a few deep breaths if necessary, and then after you're calmer, you reconnect with your child. You reconnect. You, that's when you say, you try to notice what's going on with the child, yes. and you just acknowledge it. You're so disappointed. You seem really mad. You seem cranky this morning. Are you having a hard morning? Yes. You wish I would say yes to that cookie. Whatever it is, you just comment your, you, that, that I guess what I said really annoyed you. It's too early in the morning to talk, right? I won't talk anymore right now. You know, you have a sense of humor yeah. or you have a sense of warmth and you just acknowledge their point of view. Because think about it. What would help you? If you came home from work and you were very upset yeah. and your partner said to you, don't be upset. Would that help? <laughs> Go have your tea yourself and come back when you're nice. Exactly. Exactly. What if your partner said, you seem so upset. I guess it was a hard day. Mm -hmm. Then you would, you would feel understood, right? Even if their part, your partner couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. So you talk about peacefulness a lot, which I love. It's a beautiful term. I love this in your books, this peaceful approach. Um, a lot of parents here in Germany say, yes, that's very nice. But in my life, I don't have the time to ask the child whether it's cranky. I don't have the time. We have, we have ske our schedule is so tight. We have to hurry all the time. What can we tell those parents? How can we make life easier for them? Well, one thing I would ask them is to consider what actually is good for their child. Mm -hmm. Is rushing all the time a good thing? I don't think so. Especially not if it means that mom and dad have to say to the child, stop that right now. We have to go. Right. Yes. And sometimes you will have to do that. Sometimes you will have to say, sweetheart, I see how bothered you are about this. We have to go now. If you rush a child around all the time and they, they're, they will never be at their best. They yeah. will always be depleted. And therefore you're You're depriving them of the inner resource they need to meet the demands put on them. Because when you're asking them to leave the house in the morning without the doll, they are, you're asking a lot of them. And that's okay. It's fine to ask a lot of our children. Yeah. But only when we give them their, the environment okay. that allows them to develop the inner resources. So okay. I would just ask parents in Germany who are so busy to just ask themselves if you have a plant, You have yeah. a plant on your windowsill yeah. and, your, and your plant, it doesn't look so good. Your plant is drooping. Yeah. Do you say to that plant, come on, perk up, you know, straighten up, do the right thing. No, you think, oh, what does my plant need? Yeah. Maybe some water, maybe some sunshine, maybe a bigger pot. Your child is the same way. If your child is showing you that they're having a hard time, 
ask yourself, what does my child need? Mm -hmm. Maybe they need a little more independence, a bigger pot, because autonomy is very important for children. Yeah. Maybe they need a little more time with you because there's a new baby in the family or they have a sister or brother who's quite needy and they, they need some time with you too. Okay. Or, or maybe they started school and they're having a hard time and they just need to talk to you about, my teacher is very strict and I don't know, I get scared a lot in school. Or there's a child who is a little mean and she won't let me sit with the other kids with them and I get a little worried or yeah. whatever. Right? Your child needs something. There's a reason. And if you're always rushing around, you won't ever know. Laura, thank you so much. That's a wonderful last word. And that's, I think, one of the most important things why everybody should read this book, no matter if we have children or grandchildren, or if we take care for children or work with children. And I'm so happy to see that it comes to Germany now and it's translated in German. Thank you for I being I am tonight. so delighted. Thank you. Take care and goodbye.